I decided to try to share some thoughts on open data and open source from a government or a public agency perspective. I don't think this is an audience that needs to be convinced of the value of open source. Am I right? How many people believe in it? Put hands up. Okay, everyone. Okay, don't need that. But in order to make it somewhat interesting, I thought I'll share a view, a biased view, from someone who's usually on the opposite side of the fence from you guys. Well, one and a half years ago, Singapore was blanketed by haze. Basically, some not so good chaps lit some fires in the forests of Sumatra, Riau in particular. And the problem with the forest there is that it's actually growing on peatland. For those of you who don't know, peatland basically is carbon laid down by forests that have been there millions of years ago. When you light a, a fire in that kind of forest, it's not just the trees that burn, the ground literally burns underneath you. And it burns for kilometers subterranean. And then, surprise, surprise, you get lots of haze. And it's basically small particles of carbon and other organic materials. Anyway, Singapore is blanketed by that. And the worst occurred on the 21st of June, 2013. This is just a photograph of an air quality sensor, and we've got several of these scattered across the island. And in particular, five of what we call reference stations that supply live feeds into our system. Now, this is some of the stuff which that's not so interesting. How many of you know what drums are? Anyone? What, what are the drums? No, it's not a filter. Yes, it's a musical instrument. What else? <laughs> what else do drums mean? Distortions, rumors, untruths, misinformation, and smears. So you've learned one new acronym today. Not my invention. But let me explain to you what happened. On the 19th of June, the haze levels suddenly spiked. I knew about it because my dinner was interrupted. I had to rush back to the ministry. What you see here, however, is a screen grab that was circulating widely a few hours after this. And what I wanted to show you, see that circle there? That will zoom up. How many of you can see the figure at the bottom right-hand level that says 393? You can see it? Okay. Actually, the number that we recorded was 321. How did 321 become 393? And how did this manage to convince so many Singaporeans that we're trying to pull a fast one? First of all, you guys, you're familiar with Firefox, right? I mean, I just saw an exhibition now, right? You're familiar with Firefox Developer Edition, right? You know how to download a page, right? And after you download a page, you know how to edit it, right? It's quite easy to change 321 to 393. And then you view it, and then you print screen it, and then you circulate it, and you say, aha, caught you. It was actually high, but you subsequently doctored it to 321. And during times of crisis, it's not facts that travel. It's scandal, it's distortion, it's rumors, it's misinformation, it's smears. Right? So the next day, I had to deal with a problem at multiple levels. First, what to do with the hay. Secondly, how to convince my neighbors to put out those fires. Uh, thirdly, the whole issue of credibility and trust. So following on my earlier experiment trains, I realize we now live in a time and age when governments cannot resort to censorship. You can't shut down the internet just because someone is publishing a falsehood that is inconvenient. And it reinforced my belief that you need to move into open data because you have to demonstrate and prove transparency in order to gain credibility. And 
if in order to do that, it's not only enough to just say you're transparent. You've got to show it. It's got to be real time, and it's got to be verifiable. Which means, in the example I showed you earlier, it would have been very helpful if someone somewhere else had at that same moment that same data and we'll be able to prove instantly this was doctor. So that's the first part. It's really about credibility. Now, data.gov.sg is a government website which has actually been around for a couple of years. Um, we had about 8,000 data sets on that. I was told yesterday they've just added another 5,000, so it should be 13,000, but I haven't verified it yet. In the spirit of openness, go and verify that for yourself. But I wanted to highlight that of that, there are 118 data sets which are supplied by my ministry related to the environment. Now, the problem, when you go to a typical civil servant and say, I want the data, they say, yeah, sure, I'll put out a PDF file. If you're lucky, you get a CSV file. If you're a bit luckier, maybe a text file, and Excel, especially. But no less than the Prime Minister said, no, no, that's not. When you put up data, I want it to be machine readable. Because even back in the days of the Hayes, I realized people were writing Python scripts to scrape my website in order to get the data. And actually, we should have just provided the data machine readable, accessible in real time. Everyone could look at it, everyone could verify and move on through that. So what I've done now is to insist, at least for those guys who report to me, that I want APIs. I want application, what is it, application programmable interfaces, right? And to test it, I want to be able to just write the URL and see something spit back at me. I, tend to keep my civil servants busy. So about a month ago, they said, okay, we've done eight. And this is some, so if you actually go to this website now, www.nea.gov.sg, oblique API, you will see these data sets. You will, of course, have to register, I and mean, there's just a basic precaution. But if you do that, and you put in the appropriate URL, you will get this XML file. Um, because they sent it to me at 11, I decided to test it. And it just so happened at this point in time, I'd been trying to learn a new language, I decided to pick up JavaScript. And then I decided, well, <laughs> sorry, is that, is, that, is that an unpopular language? Or, or not? <laughs> okay, well. And then they told me, well, go and look at Node, Node.js. I said, well, and I stumbled on Node Red. And this was also because at that time I've been fiddling around with Arduinos, which actually Harish first introduced to me several years ago. And I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it, but Node-RED makes it trivial to write programs that link objects and APIs with some simple logic. And I thought today I'll just show you that as an example. Because the main point I want to make is how so let me just get to my browser, and uh, this is what it, this is all. Oh, what happened to that? It doesn't like my Safari. Okay, we're getting something. Okay, that's huge, though. <laughs> yeah. Let's try that. It's amazing that we can do a lot of things, but the simplest technology still, still gets us. Okay. Okay, never mind. I'll, I'll, I'll try to. Okay. All I have to do, basically, if you think about it, I've already got it. I've registered. I've got an XML file. Basically, what I want to do is take that XML file, convert it to a JSON object, decompose the JSON object, and to be able to present real time hourly concentrations of PM2.5. 
Shopify and to make that available <laughs> on a website. And with this framework, it really is trivial. So as you can see, all you see are just boxes with lines. Uh, so the first one basically allows me to write a RESTful API called Air Quality. PM, the next one, PM 2.5, I think you can see it. Uh, all it does, it just calls. It just calls the API. Next step, translate the XML file into a JSON object. I didn't even have to type any code at all. Now, the next step involves a little bit of coding, but as you can see, it's not really rocket science. Basically, it's, it's some standard, I think it's standard, I mean, I don't know, I'm a self-talk. Uh, it basically allowed me to decompose my JSON object to pick the, the attributes that I want to, right? So what that does after that, and then I have a template so that it looks, I can, I can control this presentation layer. And then when I move on to the host and I now click it, you know, it runs a server for myself. And if I wanted to make this available, all of you are running on Bluemix or something like that. I, I, I don't really understand why you need to run servers any, anymore nowadays, but never mind. And you would get that. But that's not all that it does, because I also get it to send email notifications. So for instance, here, now, I'm going to change this email address to Roland. Is that right? That's it. Okay. I, I should point out that I did not know he was going to do this. So. <laughs> this should be interesting. So what this does is a part from providing a website where you can access it, it's also sending the same information to the email. So hit deploy, then refresh, and sometime, hopefully soon, if I, assuming I've typed it correctly, Roland should receive it. But look, not, look at not just emails, but look at all on the right hand side. Can you see all the other stuff which I can I can do? I can send a tweet, I can put up IRCs, uh, and where is that? Uh, social. I can tweet, email, IRC, and so if Roland receives a lot of spam from my email, it just means I've done an error in my programming and it. Just one. Just one, okay, so I didn't, I didn't go for it. <laughs> right. But anyway, so this was a a little test between 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. The purpose of this was really first to test that the, that the APIs they're given, giving me work. Secondly, to make the point on how trivial this whole exercise could be. Um, can I get back to my... Am I back or will I lose it? Ah, it, no, I want to get back to my, okay, I think I'm okay, yeah. <laughs> Recognize this chat. <laughs> There's actually a serious message behind that. In the midst of dealing with the problem, the newspapers reported this, this guy, Roland Turner, who doesn't believe your results, and is creating his own census. Well, okay, I'm exaggerating. <laughs> Now, think about it. From my perspective, I could say, no, he's completely wrong. He's using a different methodology to measure particles. Uh, we're using meter waves. You were using, you were counting particles. Right? And counting particles with near infrared. Which yeah, with near infrared, and we are using beta radiation to measure weight. But I realized a far more productive relationship was to recruit him, put him in touch with my chief scientist, get mutual education done, and to make him part of the solution. So really, the main point of my talk today is that I'm a believer in 
open data and open source, not for ideological reasons, but for very practical reasons. It enhances transparency, it enforces integrity and honesty. It creates opportunities for collective ownership of problems. So even if you have a different opinion from me, a different method from me, but we can still co-own the problem and hopefully be empowered to co-create solutions to the problem. And that opens up the whole realm of innovation and ultimately entrepreneurship. So for us, and I say for us, it's not just me in, in government, uh, rest assured that we will support your efforts at promoting open data and open source. We will continue to expand the data.gov.sg site. We will continue to promote hackathons and make that data available to you because I am sure you'll be able to do far more than what we can do. And because you bring a different perspective, the ability to synthesize different views, different data sets, and create novel solutions will make a difference to our society. So that's basically what I wanted to say. So thank you all. Uh, rest assured that you will always have our support. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, good job with the JavaScript. I'm teaching my nine-year-old daughter JavaScript as well. I see it as the future. So um, I like your approach and I like your talk. Uh, the question I would like to pose is, uh, what do you think can be done better to have government agencies have a more, have a quicker approach to implement APIs in the agencies? Because uh, as I see it, this API talk has been around for quite a number of years and uh, there's not much progress when in fact these are pretty trivial implementations which can be done quickly if you have the right people in place. So my question is, uh, what do you think can be done better to have all this data available in a far more efficient and faster way? You're absolutely right. The data actually is already there. Even the technology is not really a big hurdle. The real hurdle is mindset. Is, you know, for most people, especially in the past, data was power. And if I got it and you don't, I've got power. The mindset change now is to realize that real empowerment and real solutions lie in sharing that data and in allowing different minds to work on it. And that you know, this is an age in which trust in government is always a challenge. It's not, not just in Singapore, all over the world, right? But I think governments which get it and governments which they open up data and open up solution spaces to the community will build a new relationship. So we are doing this, you know, like I said, I'm not doing it for ideological reasons. I'm doing it for very practical reasons. I think it will solve real-world problems. I think it will enhance the ability for government to provide services to citizens. It will give citizens a deeper sense of engagement and ownership and bring us up to a new plane. So what we're doing, well, the chief advocate for this is the Prime Minister, so that helps. You know, if anyone says no, I just bring them up. Explain to the PM why can't be that. Now, having said that, there will be some data sets which are not going to be open. For instance, income tax data, that has to be sacred. Similarly, if there are issues involving national security, that has to be safeguarded. Now, there will be grey areas. For instance, many people have told us, you know, why does the government keep making me fill up forms, name, address? NRIC number again and again and again, right? Uh, now, on one level, you can say, well, if you share that across agencies, actually that will require some policy and maybe some legislative changes because the way we are structured right now is that if you give data to one agency, that agency is obliged <coughs> to protect that data and not let it spill out. So we will have to look at appropriate models, governance models, 
and regulations so that we can protect privacy. Because I think the big disaster waiting to happen is identity theft and loss of privacy. I think we're taking it for granted right now. But until and unless we can secure your identity and secure your privacy, otherwise my greatest worry is that we'll have one big scandal and that will set this entire open data movement back many, many years. So I'm appealing to you to understand that, you know, that we actually are on the same side, but we have to do it carefully or, or risk setting us our, our movement back. All right, so it's not going to be for lack of trying. Now, the way it works is that um, there's many, some of you in this room, you know, uh, I mean, you've got my email address. If you actually meet, come across a need for a certain data set and you think it's, it's been unreasonably withheld, just drop me a line. We'll, we'll look at it. All right. Do you have something you're chasing in particular? No, no. I mean, I think you answered the question by saying it's a mindset issue and yeah. a governance model uh, problem yeah. which you need to resolve before you can move on. Yeah. But do you agree with me? We also need to pay, you know, put some bandwidth into this issue of identity and privacy. I think absolutely. I think uh, security is, is yeah. going to be an increasing problem. Uh, yeah. So in fact, for those of you who are working in these fields of identity, security, and privacy, you've got it made. It's a growth. <laughs> It's a great thing. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so it turns out there were a questions. I have one, but so please go ahead. Good afternoon, Minister. I'm actually one of the media that did show up. Uh, so my question is simple. Um, the data sets that you've just released, it's incredible. Uh, to a layman like me, the data is... So what is some of the uses you think the community is going to have for these data sets the government has released, these machine-readable data sets? Well, I think the first thing I should say is I probably don't know what you are thinking of or what you'll be able to create. But the, my approach is we know certain data set we can't use, so we'll keep it. For everything else, the default should be to make it as open as possible. And the other thing is there's a difference between real time or, or near real time data. For instance, the stuff that I showed you is hourly. And data which is released monthly or annually or data series. And this is something I'm still discussing with my, uh, you know, with, with my data guys. I mean, they tell me, look, it doesn't make sense to release push out XML for data series. I don't know enough to be able to answer that question. Uh, it's more costly. So there's, there's a trade off. Yeah. Well. So, but. Again, you know, we will make. That's why I think the best thing is to assume that for most things, the default should be open up more, and for sp if there are specific requests, we will consider it on its own merits. Thank you, Mister. Well, what are the some kind of things you would like to see done with this data? Okay, let's think of the problems that we face. Let, let's get real, right? What are the some of the problems that we face? Give me, let me give you an example. Transport. The big bug there in Singapore, right? We've got the highest prices of cars in the world. Too many people spend too much time stuck in jams or in crowded trains, getting damn angry and voting against us. <laughs> right? Real problem. <laughs> we'll, uh, don't worry, the election's not so soon, so I'm not. But is there a way to use data to make that daily commute more efficient, more entertaining, more enriching? And the answer is yes. So, for instance, if I told you that we knew the location of every single bus and every single taxi in real time, would this be relevant to planning more optimal routes? Would this be relevant to having express services? Because you know, for instance, how many hundred people are queuing up at that bus stop, and you know where these people are going. Can you devise, you know, rather than someone just you know, sitting behind a desk and roughly guesstimating it, what if all this data is available in real time? And not trapped behind proprietary doors, because we know companies all want to build firewalls. They want their wall and gardens. What if all this was available out there? Right? Now, at the same time, I've got to make sure you can't chase your ex-girlfriend location in real time. So there are issues of, of privacy again. 
So th this is some example. We, I don't believe we can make transport better. Right? Environment, apart from getting, this is just a simple issue of transport, apart from that, one issue, for instance, is literary. Why are some people, a minority, persistently littering? What is the pattern? Who is doing it? When is it happening? Should our cleaning and our enforcement be more targeted, more directed? So there are a lot of mundane examples. Well, not so mundane examples. Healthcare. Why is it, if you go to a different doctor, a different hospital, sometimes tests get repeated? Why now, does your healthcare data belong to you, or to Apple, or to your doctor, or your hospital? And the answer is that actually it should belong to you. Now, that's easy to say in theory, but we've got a problem. Until we can secure identity, we can't have an electronic medical record that is accessible through the web. Do you agree with me? Unless any one of you have solved this problem, but you can't. So, you've got a solution? No, not a solution. Yes. Uh, one question was, uh, yeah. So, so, yeah. so, so, let, so let me just finish. So, the point is, healthcare can be made more efficient, more accessible, and hopefully more cost effective if data and the latest information was brought to bear and made available to both the patient and the doctor. So again, this is another example. So we are trying, but I hope you, you see my point that the limiting factor is not politics or ideology. The limiting factor is how can I do all this and protect your identity, protect your, your right to, to privacy. So I think these are issues which are going to occupy our, our minds and I hope you all will be part of this conversation as we evolve. Yes? Thank you. So actually to the point about uh, protecting identities. Um, the solution isn't in terms of, it, it shouldn't be looked at that there's no technical solution to it. From my point of view, it seems like the government do not have the right people to implement the technology because the technology is already available. And in the States itself, there are multiple startups um, doing exactly this thing that you're talking about, which is empowering consumers to own their own medical data. I myself, I'm working in a startup which focuses on medtech. And that is one of the problems that is important to consumers. And it, it is not without solution. There are plenty of no, solutions. I, I think there are plenty it's of a people issue. No, I think there are plenty of solutions, but I think we should be humble enough to, uh, to say that we're still not sure which is the final solution. And I think there are going to be competing solutions, and we should allow that certain healthy competition to occur. And hopefully the best product will be in an open, you know, in a, an open source uh, spirit. I'm very skeptical that someone says, I've got a final solution. No, I'm I don't not think saying so. that someone yes. has a final solution. I'm saying that there are already multiple solutions up in the market, and uh, different companies and different individuals are experimenting heavily into it. So, so instead of looking at it as a, let's wait until uh, the technology has matured before we decide yeah. to roll it out in government, why don't you look at it from the point of view of let's roll out as a small test yes. in a small, in, yes. in a controlled environment? Yes, that we will do. There are two things we will do. First is that we will define outcomes. That means we will define the performance that we want. Call for proposals, requests for information. Interesting ideas, piloted, started on a small scale, see if it will work. If it doesn't work, go back to the drawing board. So we will move away from the approach that we are find a consultant, the consultant tells us to do it this way, and then we just tender on fixed specifications. We will move towards a outcomes and performance specification, request for proposals and information, pilot trials, and then learn and improve it along the way. That's how we're going to do things from now on. I'm so looking forward to that. Uh, we are, apologies, we are right at the time. Well, well, one last question. I've, I've, been, I've been told I could. Why not let them all have their say? I'll keep quiet for a second. I have a very quick question. Firstly, thank you for coming to share your, your perspective. My question is, how can we bring your enlightened mindset to other places, countries, cities that 
perhaps living in the past. I live in the United States. <laughs> this, is my first, this is my third day in Singapore, the first time I've ever been anywhere in Asia, and it's made me realize that a lot of the United States is living in the past. So I would love to hear your advice to how to bring your mindset to other places, because uh, I see that your, your mindset as a politician is very rare, and people like us really want to spread it around. Plus, Thank you. Look at that. <laughs> I'm going to let everyone ask first, uh, because okay. otherwise I take too long. I think what he said is very correct. Actually, I would also like to see this, that your mindset has been transferred to other nations. I have lived in three or four of myself, and very rarely I find such examples. So it was great actually seeing somebody really doing something what he preaches others. That's one thing. Uh, my question was regarding the, when we were talking about it, it was related to the medical information, right? Uh, I do understand that there is a lot of talk on the personally identifiable information regarding patient data, insurance data, and this one. In my experience while I was working with the pharmaceutical industry, I realized that you can anonymize that part of the information, but uh, information of the data which can be made available is like what kind of disease numbers which are spreading in those areas, what kind of hospitals with how many beds are available, how, what kind of a doctor number with the specialties are available in those kind of areas. Are there any plans to bring back that kind of data into public, especially for public medical hospital, maybe not private? Okay, um, thank you very much for the opportunity and for you to come here and speak. Congratulations on taking on the role as the Minister for you know, looking after the Smart Nation. It's specific about Smart Nation. Um, my, my concern is, again, you talked about privacy and security. Uh, I haven't heard yet uh, from anyone, uh, you haven't articulated perhaps, is what is the basic underlying principle of the Smart Nation? Uh, one of the things that I've been looking at is to make sure that there are three principles around it, uh, three pillars. Uh, it is built securely from get-go, it is built on open standards from get-go, and there is an open source reference implementation of whatever is be being built, so that we can always plug and play from whoever else wants to provide it. So, do you have any thoughts around that? Because I think that's an important aspect if you yeah. want to move forward. Yeah. You don't mind answer the questions in reverse. So, you, your point, built securely, we believe that security has to be built at initial, by design. Not create a system and then worry about plugging the holes. So yes, this is an important pillar. That's also why we've just created a cyber security agency. Because without security, all the other things are at risk. Your other point is on open standards. Yes, this is something I believe in. Uh, I sometimes have to push against resistance, but I believe in open standards. And as you've understood from my talk, the reason I believe in it is because it allows more players, more competition, and more innovation to be brought to bear. And that ultimately bears fruit in better services, better value products, and hopefully better business options for our people. The larger question behind Smart Nation is this. You know, the political problem in most parts of the world right now is about inequality and middle class stagnation. Many people, I believe, are barking up the wrong tree. And, you know, the political left and the political right are arguing at cross purposes. The reason why middle class wages are stagnating is not because this is a right wing conspiracy is because we are living in the digital age. And in the digital age, it's not just equality of opportunities, but the ability to exploit opportunities that makes the difference. And we are now living in an age when if you're the owner, or you are the creator, or you are the most popular singer, actor, sportsman, as long as you're number one, you are on the top of an exponential curve. Number two is at least two-thirds or half of where you are at. So, in the same way, we're getting very asymmetric 
distribution of the spoils of the digital age. You see this at individual level, you see this at company <coughs> level. The biggest company market cap right now today is Apple. I think it's about 600 plus. What's number two or number three? What do you think? You end up with Google, you end but you know what Google's market cap is compared to Apple? It's only two thirds. So what I'm saying is that individual level, at company level, you see very steep curves. The other phenomenon which you're seeing, you know, the, the business consultants like to talk about S curves. You know, a company you grow slowly, then you have a rapid expansion phase, and then you plateau, right? And those S curves used to take. 20, 30, 50 years. Well, guess what? Today, if you look at the S curves of the internet companies, you're lucky they're 10 to 20 years. So, what all this means is that if you have a country or a city or a people that are not prepared for this, there's going to be gut wrenching changes, there's going to be unemployment. There's going to be the depression of middle class wages because routine white collar middle class jobs are going to be replaced by machines and smart technologies, many of which you all are going to, to create. So when Singapore says smart nation, it's not another fad or another ideological thing. It's actually born out of a bit of paranoia that we need to stay on the right side of the curve. The reason why we're spending, we're going to spend a billion dollars a year on skills future, the reason why we're going to try to teach all children to code, or at least understand computational thinking, the reason why we want to make data available to everyone, so that you can massage it, you can analyze it, you can create new products, is because we want to make sure Singaporeans are not fighting a losing battle to be cheaper, better, faster than a robot. We want Singaporeans to be creators, designers, programmers, operators of the robots, not the losing competitors of the robots. So actually that's where the real you know, energy or the real, the real angst behind what we're doing. So yes, there is a sense of urgency and I, I, I agree with the principles that you have enunciated. Now, the third point you made was about open source. Yeah. Open source implement, reference <laughs> implement. Yes. Yes. Now, this part I'm not going to be able excessively dogmatic. I think where possible and where it makes sense, it fits for purpose, we should do so. But let me tell you one reservation I have with open source, which is that as I look around the room, I wonder how many of you personally are going to be millionaires. It sounds uncool to talk about it. But actually, I do need at least some of you to be millionaires on the basis of your open source work. Because... I volunteer. <laughs> okay, no. But it needs to happen because otherwise, you guys are all going to work very hard and someone else is going to make a profit, right? And that is not a basis for a sustainable movement. So I'm just sharing with you my anxiety about the open source movement, that whether it will make enough millionaires of the people like you who are going to work so hard and spend so much, so many years of your life chasing. So for that reason, I'm not going to be excessively dogmatic. If you finally come to me with a product, and as I said, in the way we're going to do it is we specify outcomes. You come to me with a product, you prove that it works. I will of course ask you whether it can be open source, and you say no, it can't, and you can convince me. I'm not going to rule you out simply because it's <coughs> open source. But yes, I know many of you will still make a healthy living, a good living, by being consultants and by providing services. But just bear this mind, this point in mind, right? That look around the room. If we can get, how many millionaires do you want down here? 100%. If we get 100%, our problems are over, right? But it's 
it's not going to be so simple. So, so that's my, my slight anxiety about this point. On the other two questions, the question on, on data, uh, you're right. If, for instance, data on waiting times, data on heat maps of crowds can be suitably anonymized and lead to better uh, delivery of services, we will do so. But bear in mind there was this uh, study, I think they were doing it of New York cabs. Right? It was supposed to be anonymized. But with intelligent analysis, they were able to identify who were the Muslim uh, cab drivers based on their patterns five times a day or particularly on Friday. So bear in mind that even with the best of efforts, there are still some risks. And I hope you agree with me where people's financial and health data is concerned. Uh, we have to lean more towards uh, security and privacy rather than experiment. So by all means, experiment in my environmental data. I don't think there's so much risk to your privacy. Uh, and, I'm, and in the case of the other advantage that Singapore government has, and this relates to the, the first set of questions about going to other countries, uh, we've got a couple of advantages. Our Prime Minister is a mathematician and was coding decades ago. He still can code. Half our cabinet are engineers or former engineers, or they're not engineers, then they're surgeons or doctors like me. We understand science, we understand mathematics, understand statistics, so we sort of get it. I mean, you may not agree with us, with our political views, but I think on science and on data and on programming, we get it. It's quite different in other countries where the majority of politicians have spent their entire life politicking. I mean, they've never had a real job, they've never programmed something, they've never run a company. It's very difficult. Uh, so, no, we can't just go out and say, you know, do be like Singapore. And in any case, our final and biggest advantage is that we are small. It's much easier to run a small place. You know, I can sit down here and talk to all of you. I mean, it, it's very hard to do in a much, much bigger country. So, the level of, the degrees of separation in Singapore, because we are small, is much less than six. So there are things that we can do here which is much harder than any other place. So I'll give you a final example. We are not Silicon Valley. We will not even pretend to be Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is unique. It is where the transistor was invented. There was that unique combination of academia and finance and business together with the internet and the Department of Defense Investments, I mean, I think it's a once-in-a-lifetime place where not only do you have technology, not only do you have money, you've got smart money. Money that angel investors were able to mentor, able to network and connect. We don't have that debt. But what we can offer is, you know, I just, I was in Silicon Valley uh, few weeks ago and just asked about bandwidth and there are many places in Silicon Valley where even if you wanted to pay for it, you can't get a fraction of the, of the speed that we can. We can deliver fiber. Yes, we can argue about how slow sometimes. When we say slow, it means a couple of weeks. But we can argue, but we can deliver it to every home. Right? So because we are small, because we have a single layer of government, on the infrastructure point side of it, I intend to be top of the world. There's no reason for us not to. Then, having done that, we can then open up our, our data, open up our problems, open up our challenges worldwide and say, if you've got a solution that will solve healthcare, solve transport, solve business, whatever real-world problem, proof of concept is in Singapore. It works in Singapore, we upscale it to a national level, you will have opportunities all over the world because your calling card will say, I solved it in Singapore. Come to Singapore, see my product in action. Now, let's start talking about how it will work in countries which are far bigger, far more complex than Singapore. So, in other words, we just, we cannot be the center of the universe, but we can be part 
of a global node of smart nations and smart cities, part of their value chain. As long as we can capture some of it for our people and for the friends of Singaporeans, I think we'll be all right. So I hope I've given you some idea of why we're doing what we're doing and some idea of our strategy and also hopefully convinced you that we're going about it in a deliberate, careful and reasonable way without hubris and without arrogance uh, and that it's a realistic plan. And finally, as I, I just want to emphasize again, I really want all of you to succeed and because I think this goes far beyond just a preference or an ideology. I think many of the challenges that the world is confronting can be solved with the values that underlie the open source, open data movement. Because it is based on honesty, it is based on rigor, it is based on sharing, it is based on innovation. If we can do this and replicate it, we'll solve a lot of world problems. So thank you all again very much. I really, really wish you all the very best. Thank you.